Okay, I think we will begin before we lose all of you to coffee and the many other lovely things that are out, out um, the side door. Uh, we'll, we'll start right away. We're, we're just a few minutes behind, which is, I think, tremendously impressive on the part of, uh, of our director, Robin. I am Leslie Vinjamori. I am the new head of the US and the Americas program here at Chatham House and dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy. And I must say, I am delighted at, to be here. Um, we're just careful just behind you. And, uh, and welcome you to this first plenary. Um, those of you, many of you I'm sure have been to the London conference that Chatham House has hosted for several years now, but those of you who are new, welcome, and I hope that we will see you not only at the London conference going forward, but also at many of our smaller workshops and conferences and events. It's an extraordinary place to be. I have to say it's been my favorite engagement uh, of my career, and, and I really do highly recommend us to you, um, so, and, and you to us. So, Welcome. Today's panel, we have one hour, it's no small task, to deal with strategies and instruments for dealing with increased geopolitical competition. So since we only have one hour, you clearly do need to come back, not only today and tomorrow, uh, but in the weeks and months uh, to come. We have a terrific um, set of panelists. We are very fortunate. And I will introduce them to you just very briefly. So please do uh, take a careful look at their biographies. Um, to my left, we have Marie-Louise Beck, who was a member of the Green Party for many years. Uh, she was in the German Parliament from 1983 to 2017. Uh, she is now at the Center for Liberal Modernity um, and has had a very important, um, important effect in, in Germany, as many of you will know. Um, just next to her is Dr. Dove Zackheim, who is currently a senior advisor for the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, but spent many years um, working in the Reagan administration and the Bush administration. He was Under Secretary of Defense from 2001 to 2004. And, and there's another little side note, but I'll let him give that to you uh, when, when it's his turn to speak. Um, just next to him is uh, Kevin Rudd, again, who will be very well known to you, mostly because he's a senior advisor at Chatham House, but also because he was Prime Minister of Australia from 2007 to 2010, and then again uh, in, in, in 2013. Um, so we are very honored uh, to have you here today, Kevin. And finally, last but obviously not least, um, Hina Rabani Kar, who was Foreign Minister of Pakistan from 2011 to 2013, who I found very inspirational the first time that I heard her speak at the London Conference. And so it's a, a very real honor to have, to be able to chair you on today's panel. Um, I want to start us out with, uh, to give each of the panelists just one question and, and two sentences to respond before we have about 15 minutes of, of a few more questions, and then we'll open it up to each of you. Um, and, the, and the question, in today's world is obviously one that we, uh, in which we feel the effects of geopolitical competition from a rising China, from a Russia that is not backing down and really wants to claim its space in the liberal order, or perhaps it wants a different kind of order and doesn't like the one that's emerged since the end of the Cold War. There are a number of geopolitical challenges that we're grappling with. In many ways, they're not new. These are questions that emerged um, quite a long time ago. Uh, certainly in the run-up to China's accession to the World Trade Organization, there was a robust debate about what was the optimal strategy for engaging China. But they do feel like very different set of questions, or at least that the stakes are much higher, that we're at a flashpoint, an inflection point and that the global context is perhaps not one, certainly in Europe and in the United States, where leaders uh, and publics are demonstrating the willingness or the ability to respond collectively, collaboratively, or effectively. There's a really very significant turn inward that we are all painfully aware of, um, certainly in London, in Britain, and in Europe, and certainly at Chatham House. So let me pose a very quick question to each of you, an impossible question, but at least we'll begin our conversation. And that is, from where you sit, um, what for you is the most pressing, urgent, and high stakes geopolitical threat? And what is your, um, what do you think the optimal way of, of addressing this is? Since we are on a panel about, that's about strategies uh, for dealing with geopolitical competition. Perhaps we'll start we won't go in a row. We'll start with Kevin, since he's right in the middle. Um, Kevin, if you could perhaps start us out. Well, my response would be, um, 
not classic geopolitics, but geoeconomics becoming geopolitics, and that is, uh, if the trade war uh, expands, what does it do to the forces of, let's say, Chinese nationalism at home? What does it do uh, to uh, the incremental and then growing uh, fracturing of the global free trade order in a relatively quick period of time? and the nationalisms to which that gives rise around the world. What do you do about it? I mean, my response would be, the only place this can be arrested is where it begins, and that is by global corporations, which are American corporations, uh, telling their congressmen uh, and their senators and their state governors that this will hurt America much more than it will hurt China or the rest of the world. Hina, can I come to you next? Yes. Uh Thank you for that. And uh, uh, Kevin, having taken care of the geoeconomic side, I think I'm going to really uh, go on the opposite uh, side of it. Uh, to me, a very big threat that is emerging uh, in the world and has emerged more uh, openly in the last 10 years is to look for unilateral solutions to uh, global problems. Uh, and when I say that, uh, what I mean is that there are, uh, there are ways which are uh, globally acceptable, uh, legally acceptable ways, which uh, through the UN, etc., in which how we deal with the problem. And then there are ways which a country, a single country, be it even a superpower, decides to solve a problem which is of global nature but has a unilateral response to it, has a local response to it. So the, the question of, for instance, what happened in Jerusalem, the question of the use of drone strikes, the question of going into areas which we think are problematic with unilateral strikes of one or more uh, group uh, countries, it then creates repercussions which are huge, not for the country which is the doer, but the country that is being done with. Thank you. Uh, Adav, to you. Um, I think the biggest problem which in effect underlies uh, both of what you've just heard is the gap between elitism and populism. Uh, Frankly, if there isn't uh, some kind of coming together, you're going to see populism driving trade policy, driving military policy, driving virtually all policies, and then it'll be very hard for nations to work together to solve anything. So I think the answer has to be, frankly, on the side of the elites. They're the ones who have to reach out to the ordinary folks. The ordinary folks are not going to reach out to the elites. And uh, Marie Louise. <laughs> well, this picks up the, uh, my my uh, idea about fear on one side of a world which is changing in a rapid way, like we think we've never had it before. Fear of many people that they are not going to have a place in those modern societies anymore, and on the other side, the lack of trust that democracies will be able to solve their problems because we are debating, we have different opinions, we are accusing each other once in a while, although we don't even believe in the accusation, but it, it works well on TV or in the social media. So trust which people would need in those times of challenge is very important and overall, we need unity within the West along the values of freedom, of humanitarian thinking, of rule of law, and really sticking together and understanding who are those who want to blow us up. Okay, so we have a number of responses that draw us into domestic uh, politics within the West, uh, one that's more specifically outwardly oriented, but many that are looking back inside to see what the response should be. Let's, let's build on these and talk specifically about China. And perhaps I'll, I'll come right back to Kevin again, because um, uh, Kevin, uh, you, you once said that you thought it was a mistake of the West to assume that as China rose and became more significant and more powerful economically, that it would naturally become a willing and able participant and leader of the liberal economic order, and that this was a mistaken vision 
So I'm curious, based on what you've just said, uh, how, how would you draw this out in terms of um, what's at stake now and what, what strategies and responses um, beyond the internal, globally and regionally, should, should, there, should there be to China? I think it's important in the current period to understand how China views the world and how they're seeking to uh, deal with uh, the challenges which we've just touched on. I think, firstly, uh, it's been complete um, exercise in hope uh, triumphing over analysis uh, to assume for the last several decades uh, that China uh, would transform itself into a form or another, or let's call it the Western Liberal Democratic Project. That was never a prospect, um, but it's surprising. I still find the number of people who simply uh, chose to um, uh, smoke that particular cigarette um, and become high on it. Um, so uh, China's statecraft is much more uh, nationalist and pragmatic than that. Uh, always has been. And so its interests are, one, keep the party in power. It's a Leninist state. Number two, uh, keep the country together. Uh, that's critical for party legitimacy, uh, which is all about Tibet, Taiwan, Xinjiang. Three, grow the economy, um, lift living standards, but now do it sustainably because people don't want to suffocate. And then when you start flipping over to the external domain, it's uh, China's 14 neighbouring states, in their view, uh, optimally becoming critically dependent on China so that none of them provide China with any trouble on its immediate periphery. Uh, and that has, that's the prism through which we should look at the Korean Peninsula. I think number five is um, how does China uh, advance its interests in its maritime periphery? And its interests are to push the United States out. Um, that's very clear in China's public statements, and fracture U.S. alliances in the West Pacific. Coming back this way towards Europe, uh, I think the, if I was trying to go through where the Chinese interest now stands, it's across Eurasia through the Belt and Road Initiative, but beyond that as well, to cause China to become the indispensable economic power across this large continental landmass. Uh, and to turn it into a much more benign strategic and economic environment for itself than the Pacific has been since the war, in fact, since before the war, with the dominant president of the United States. And the final one, I think, in the, as China looks at what's unfolding, is looking at the rules of what we blithely describe as the global rules-based order. The Chinese don't want to change this lock, stock and barrel. They have no interest in doing that. But they do have an interest in having a bigger voice within the councils of the world which give effect to the rules-based order and in changing some of the rules which fundamentally act against their interests, like the uh, Human Rights Commission uh, in Geneva. I see the Americans have left first. That's kind of interesting. Um, but I think we should have a very sort of pragmatic understanding of China's very pragmatic view of its future, an understanding where our interests and as those in the West intersect and overlap with those values and interests and where they don't. Good. Dov, you, um, you've been very supportive. Uh, you thought the national security strategy was a good document. Um, what does it say about China? Why is it right? And is, uh, is Trump doing the right thing? Well, those are two very different things. Uh, the, the, the little bit that uh, was mentioned earlier that about me that I was supposed to talk about is that I signed both of those national security letters about Mr. Trump. So you know where I stand on that. Um, I hope he read the national security strategy. Um, in any event, it was uh, formulated by two people that he's gotten rid of. So it's not at all clear to me where we, the national security strategy actually fits with his own thinking. Um, but on China, it's, it's quite clear that um, the defense community sees China as a potential adversary. On the other hand, and this isn't as well appreciated, the, the folks in the Pentagon are constantly reaching out to China uh, and trying to meet with their opposite numbers wherever it's possible. Now, sometimes politically it's not, 
But there is a sense that uh, while on the one hand there's tremendous concern about what China's doing in the South China Sea, on the other hand, there's a sense also that China is maybe just beginning to realize that what it's trying to do in the South China Sea could bite it in the Arctic because the Canadians and the Danes and all the other countries that could frankly do the very same thing and keep the Chinese out when China wants to, as Kevin just said, reach out to Europe in a very different way. Um, so uh, I think there's a great degree of ambivalence. Uh, clearly we're building up. Um, Mr. Trump, whatever else he may have done, uh, is putting more money into the military and giving Mr. Mattis a lot of leeway, perhaps more than people realize. Um, but essentially, there is not a sense that we must go to war with China. And I think that's terribly important. And Hina, from where you sit, very different perspective. I know you, in your time as foreign minister, thought a lot about regional cooperation between India and Pakistan. Uh, but as you look to China, what is your perspective, both on what the, you know, the, the role that the U.S. is playing now, but more from the point of view of Pakistan and your yeah. own region? Okay, this is uh, fascinating for me, and it's so very interesting, because I'm a big believer in geography. I believe geography is the revenge of geography, etc. And it is so interesting as to what is the perspective on China, depending on where in the world you were born, simply. Okay? Because China uh, is viewed very differently from where I come from than it is by you know, many of the people represented in this room in, in countries. And uh, I, I, want, I, I just want to just point out one or two things before I go specifically on that. First of all, I believe the rule-based order currently is being threatened far more by the US than by China. So when we have that debate, I think it's important to understand and realize that. Secondly, I truly believe that the national security document of the US in some ways also shows how US is going to be, uh, is becoming much more parochial in its perception of threat to its hegemonic power status rather than the global good. Okay, so if the perceived threat now is emanating from China and Russia, uh, getting a status which is higher to that, to, to that of the US, and the US must draw all its energy to react to that rather than to you know, terrorism, global terrorism, etc. It just shows that in a very, very obvious uh, manner. Um, I also want to say that, uh, you know, uh, so now coming, coming back to the specifics, you see, what China is perceived by the rest of the world is a country which in many ways minds its own business in my part of the world, uh, does not lecture everybody else, but shows through its own progress in some ways as to what is the way to go, right? So it lets you be, it lets you grow, develop, prosper, and then it comes out to assist you in ways others are not willing to, okay? And I want to point out, it's interesting because, you know, I'm not at all the type of global citizen that my good friend and ex uh, colleague is not that level of global citizen, but I'm a mini global citizen and also a very, uh, a very, a very big Pakistani citizen. <laughs> and to me, it's always interesting when I go to uh, conferences such as this and smaller group meetings with really important people, how people complain about how China is trying to use the AIIB bank to try and have prowess into the countries, you know, and try and manage their economics and try and be a political player. And I said, well, what about the World Bank? And what about the IMF? And what about the Asian Development Bank. When you do it, it's fine, and it's being a global leader and holding the liberal order. And when China does it, it is China being colonial. Okay? So the colonial China right now is quite being liked where I come from. It, being leading, it is leading on SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. These regional forums, by the way, because this is the part of the bigger debate also that we're having, these regional forums are far outstripping the global ones that we know because they're seen to be delivering. And I just want to end with one specific, because, you know, we talked about international development over here. I had the fortune of managing Pakistan's aid portfolio before I became foreign minister for seven years of my life, right? And I can tell you that whereas it is very assuaging for our colonial conscience or our uh, white man's burden, okay, to give to the poor all over the world, uh, you don't give the way the poor ask all over the world. You give according to what your parliaments want to give, right? So when the poor all around the world, for instance, say we need a hydro project because we do not have, you say, no, 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 we want to feed the girls only. And well, you cannot constant, so you, 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 international development is done by the West in a way which is not as effective or as tangible 
tangible as is done by China. And I think that has a huge, huge impact. Mary Louise, I'm going to use, uh, turning to you to bring us from China to Russia, because you've worked so much of your career thinking about Russia um, in, a, in a difficult context where you haven't always been necessarily supported by those around you and your view. Um, is there something to be said if we, if we follow this line of thinking that, you know, China's at some level minding its own business and, and doing things in the region that uh, the U.S. has certainly done and others have done, and perhaps, perhaps Russia's concerns are legitimate about um, the, the international order and certainly the order as it's been constructed in the post-Cold War period. Um, is there an argument to be made for spheres of influence? I suspect you'll say not, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. <coughs> I think what we can see is that China is at the moment um, more walking like a cat internationally and Russia is more walking like an elephant. Um, <laughs> so the cat is very self-confident. They have time. They are a big country. They are growing. Uh, they are economically at the moment, very successful, and they have a strategy. Silk Road, I just uh, n name one of it, and we see the strategies in Africa, and they don't uh, cry about human rights, like the, na the nasty and silly Western democracies do. I have experienced how Chancellor Merkel started and tried to talk about human rights questions to the former uh, uh, prime minister, and it was somehow like, can you please tell the guy standing at the door those stories? They are boring me. Russia is different. Um, they are tough, and they are obviously and visibly hurting the rules which we have created together. And I really I think we have to remind that, have created together with many hopes in the 80s and then in the 90s. Integrities of uh, our borders, the right to join uh, institutions on a free will. And if you take Ukraine, where the West asked Ukraine to give away 1,000 atomic weapons, accepting that the neighbor Russia is keeping their atomic weapons, and we told them, be calm, we sign a paper, Russia signed it, you will have your integrity, and now we have Crimea. So, Russia is not hiding that they want to hurt the rules and that they are hurting the rules, very often the West does not want to see it because it did not only start with Crimea, at least at 2008. We should have started to understand that there obviously is a strategy in, in Kremlin and a wish, and this is to come back to some part of the old growth which the Imperium Russia has had. And this is, does not only mean recollecting what has gone lost, and that's why the people in the Baltic are a little more nervous than we are in Germany, and we should understand that. It's not only recollecting, but it is also destroying the unity which is a serious or could be a serious opponent on the other side, and this is the European Union. And the drama is that obviously the European Union or many leaders have not understood that. And I only say why two words. I don't want to embarrass the Brits, that's why I say Brexit and no more. And since I, don't, I want to be polite, I say Nord Stream 2 because this addresses Germany making our own deals with Russia and with Kremlin, forgetting about the others, is exactly what plays into Kremlin's hands. And if we are silly enough to destroy our unity ourselves, then 
who could help us. Okay, so 60 seconds from each of you before we open up to the audience. Kevin, is China a cat and Russia is an elephant? Well, I'm, I'm a sinologist and I'm, I've been to Moscow enough times to know that I don't understand Russia. Uh, so let me simply speak uh, about the Chinese. They have a grand strategy. Uh, Chinese folks will tell you that they don't. They do. Um, mm. It's very well considered, it's very well developed, it's uh, done by consensus through their system, and therefore it is highly intelligent. Uh, more intelligent than either of the two cats that I've got at home, uh, in my observation. Um, the question for the rest of us, uh, who are part of different geographies in, their, in, in relation to the rise of China, is the terms of engagement. And what I'd say to this audience in my end of my 60 seconds is, those who believe in the principles of the international liberal uh, rules-based order, if you actually believe in it, uh, let me tell you, uh, people in the Asian hemisphere are now of the view that the collective West is just hauling up the white flag and it's game over. If that is not the case, then it's time for the collective West to start thinking about what it actually stands for and whether it wishes to dig in in defence of the fundamental principles of open economies, open societies, and open politics. Dov, China's a cat, Russia's uh, an elephant. I think Kevin's put it very well about China, and he knows a lot more about it than I do. Let me just say about Russia, I think the sense, at least in Washington, is that Russia, uh, I think it's an insult to elephants, frankly. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that um, Mr. Putin may not have a grand strategy, but he certainly has a strategy. Uh, look at Russia's position in the Middle East today and compare it to, say, the early 1970s when they were kicked out of Egypt. Uh, and I think that unless, uh, A, the West is united, as you said, Marie-Louise, and secondly, uh, unless we show that, for instance, on Ukraine, we mean what we say. And in this case, Mr. Trump has authorized weapons that Mr. Obama did not. So I give him credit for that. Uh, we shouldn't just, whatever we think of him, we, sh we should call them as we see them. And he's been right on this one. Unless Mr. Putin sees that a door is slammed in his face, he's going to walk through it every single time. So a tough response required. And Hina, from you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, frankly speaking, I, I will still insist that I see it much less of a threat emanating from Russia and from China that the world together, the good world together has to deal with. I think we're all good or bad at an equal level right now in some ways. And I think this uh, tendency to want to make sense of what is happening, this disorder which is currently we are experiencing is real. Okay, so our assumption is that some order has to immediately emerge out of it. I think they, that may not be necessarily true. There is a changing dynamics. Uh, and interestingly, you know, for instance, at Davos, it was President Xi Jinping, not President Trump, who was trying to propagate free trade. Okay, so are we going to, uh, you know, look at uh, countries through their historical roles or the roles that they're playing today? I think it's important to wake up to the realization and start judging each other from the roles that we're playing today. It may be, uh, much as we like to call them revisionist powers, it may be that one of the, the, the other country, which is considered to be the world global leader, the perhaps the only superpower, may be right now in the realm of being a revisionist power in some ways, right? So I don't see the threat emanating from these two countries as much as my other very, very Fine, I'm going to make you wait because we're going to open it up to the audience, but you will get your say. We're, I'm going to collect because a few questions. Of the, because of the animals. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'm going to take two or three, uh, take them in clusters. If you say your name and your affiliation, and you don't have to ask a question, you do have to be succinct, but you don't have to ask a question. If you'd like to make an intervention, I would encourage you, and please do. Um, we'll come right here to the woman. They're roving mic, so if you wait for the mic, and uh, please feel free to stand. That would be lovely. Hi, my name is Xochitl Barranco. I'm a Mexican Chevening scholar. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And actually, to be here, I had to answer a question, which was, which are the opportunities in terms of international cooperation within a geopolitical, globally competition world? And I think my answer was quite good, as I'm here. But uh, I would honestly want to listen what you have to say, especially uh, from an, a perspective outside only the US and Russia, as uh, here the foreign minister of Pakistan was 
mentioning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, straight back in the middle here, the gentleman with his hand held very, very high. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ismet Fatih Chanjar. I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm also a tuning scholar with my fellow colleague. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. It has been wonderful. Um, my question is in regards, so I'm coming from the Balkans, which is, well, the history speaks for itself. And especially in the recent times, there's been a lot of uh, intervention from foreign influence, especially Russia in the case of Balkans, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Republic of Srpska, Serbia, and also Montenegro with the net accession and things like that. My question is, why is that, um, Ms. Ms. Beck said that the Baltic states are quite uh, cautious, afraid. I'd say also that the- Baltic. Baltic, yeah. I'm talking about Balkans. Yes. Oh, you said Balkans. <laughs> anyway, I will say that also Balkan <laughs> states are started. quite uh, <laughs> afraid because of the intervention of Russia's influence, especially Russia, there's also Turkey there, in Europe, on the border of Europe. My question is, why is it the European Union or the West is um, less active in that area when that could be a special problem considering, for example, radical terrorism that can ha happen, extremism on the border of Europe that presents also security issues to Europe. So there's that. Thank you very much. And from the side. Quiet over here. Okay, we'll come back to the far side. Gentlemen, right far in the back, right there, just next to you. There you go, exactly. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Xiao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I've got a question just to follow up the interesting discussions uh, because I recall that the UN Secretary General uh, not long ago said that he sees a uh, return of the Cold War with revenge. So I don't know if you agree with his assessment. I'm actually going to take one more right up front here in the front session, the section, the lady, exactly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Oksana. I'm Chimnik Scholar as well as I'm a member of Chetman House. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm Russian. I'm Russian studying public administration in the UK. And to be honest, when it comes to political talks, uh, you know, like being Russian, <laughs> we feel like it's like an illness and can't be treated at all. And... Um, um, like, you know, there are a lot of motives behind uh, current behavior of Russian government, but I'm wondering why um, a senior politician don't want to talk about differences in mentality, because in my opinion, it can explain a lot in current behavior and current political situation. And I'm just interested, what's view of the mentality of Russian and maybe uh, mentality of our president, which has to meet expe expectation of, of his people? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to the panel. We'll keep our responses fairly short so we can turn to the audience again. But I know you would like to um, speak first. Yes. Talking about the Balkans and the Baltic states. The Baltic states at the moment try to show the European Union and NATO that they are really worried that Putin might take a next step after Crimea and Donbass. And talking about my country, uh, we love to turn this idea down by saying, come on, you just want to go back into the Cold War. Because we don't really want to see uh, reality and the danger. Which does not mean that you start a war from your side. It's not about going in or answering militarily against Russia or Kremlin. Nobody from the West has proposed that. But this creates an asymmetric situation, and we must understand that. Now, and then you should not start dividing yourself up on the other instrument which you used, which was the sanctions. And I mean, how silly can we be Kremlin listening and hearing every day that we ourselves 
are fighting about that one non-militarian instrument which we decided as an answer, we do not want you to go for the next step and to hurt the rules which have created peace in Europe. Taking the Balkans, again, we are not, we don't really want to see what is happening there. We can see how Montenegro is sub, sub -mined. We can see how Serbia is working on two legs, one west and one uh, east. We can see that Croatia is not on a good way towards democracy, but we rather don't look, and my feeling is, eyes wide shut, because we don't have the answer and because we are not united. And we do not have May, Merkel and Macron traveling to meet Mr. Putin, telling him you have those wonderful football games now, but we want to see Oleg Sentsov in freedom. We don't have the 3M anymore, and we would need it. And this is what our problem is. So, the Russian people at the moment, and I'm so close to Russia, uh, they don't have a good future with this kind of politics. The young people know that they are going betrayed and they're leaving the country, like maybe you. And I hope that what what will not, what Kremlin will not manage to do to finally cut the relations between the population and the people of Russia and the Western people. I want us to stick together. We have a long way to go, but Kremlin at the moment with a constant propaganda you are not Europe, you are Eurasian, you are different, and they don't want you. They are really making that Russian people crazy and coming from Germany. I think we have an experience how much and how much harm propaganda can do to a people. Thank you. We should all be so lucky to leave the country as a evening scholar. <laughs> um, uh, who would like to take another? I'll take, a okay, go. I'll take a stab at the Cold War question. Um, the fundamental of the Cold War was that uh, at Yalta, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to a s spheres of influence mm -hmm. and handed Mr. Stalin Eastern Europe. <laughs> uh, I don't know that the West perceives this as a Cold War yet. I think Mr. Putin wants to have a Cold War in the sense that he wants the spheres of influence back. And if you look at uh, what he is trying to do in Hungary, uh, what he's trying to do in other uh, states that were once part of uh, the Soviet Empire, uh, the worries about the Baltic states are another example of that. But it's different in the sense that during the Cold War, everything pretty much east of the inner German border was part of the Soviet sphere. Now, this, Russia has NATO countries all around its borders. That is a huge difference. So that the West's objective is to avoid a Cold War as much as possible, because that will protect the NATO states wherever they are, including tiny Montenegro. Baltics, Balkans rather. Montenegro is part of NATO now. It's amazing. I don't know what their army will do for us, but in any event. Um, <laughs> We have Iceland as well, so we have a few countries that contribute in ways other than just the military. But from Mr. Putin's perspective, the whole objective is to return to the Cold War. Because during the Cold War, China wasn't a player, nobody else was a player. It was just the, the Soviet Union and the United States. That's where he wants to go, and that's what we have to stop. You know, would you like to come in? Yeah, just very quickly. I think, I think we've, we've come a long way from the times of the Cold War, and I think uh, the fact you know, um, the, the different things which show you how a country is viewing itself. And so if you look at how China and Russia have been acting and reacting within the Security Council on many, many international global issues, even that of conflict, you will understand, I, I, to me, uh, I understand from it that Mr. Putin is quite well aware that he, it is not Russia versus everyone else. That, but I, I do want to say over here that I think why the Cold War of yesteryears is perhaps, um, you know, you cannot go back into the same times, is also because at that time, the moral authority that remained with the propagators of the liberal 
order was being widely accepted and seen to be very, very true. So uh, credibility and predictability are two values uh, which are exceptionally important from anyone who wants a go at global leadership. I believe that both predictability and credibility are in short supply from the us, because we like to look at it as us versus them. So us, the good us. The good us haven't done much good. Uh, so if you look at Yemen, if you look at Syria, if you look at many other conflict situations, or if you look at global goods such as, why, there was another question, why, what would make international world cooperate? I think global goods such as environmental concerns and trade, if that cannot make us all cooperate, in, then clearly nothing else can, right? But on those two global goods, do you see the performance of us? So you know the us may seem very grand uh, because of our past, and I don't mean R because I'm not part of this world, but, uh, but, but the us doesn't appear to be as grand and credible and holder and propagator of moral values. When you look at the refugee situation, how many, barring Germany, which I, I think was viewed by the rest of the world, how many countries have opened their arms, as they've been telling countries like Pakistan to forever take the three million refugees from Afghanistan as our own responsibility? That is what we are tell, told by the us to the them, right? But when it comes to the us themselves, they close their doors and they let children balk for their mothers and have separation on borders. So this is the us that the world is seeing. Much as you may not want to see it, this is what the world is seeing. Uh, Kevin, a response from you? I think uh, the general critique of the West, which uh, Hina has delivered uh, as a torpedo amidships, um, was very effective. Uh, and I think the collective West, particularly Europeans, uh, monstrously uh, unaware of the historical legacy of their collective colonialisms um, right across Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, and by and large, because all the wealth came to this continent, it's kind of not recognised. But the long fuse of, uh, let's call it, post-colonial history is still alive in the world, hence the rolling critique of Western hypocrisy. That is a given and as the only Western country apart from New Zealand in Asia, we are deeply sensitive to that reality. Um, flipping back to the Cold War and the question asked by our friend from the Chinese Embassy and dovetailing it with our Mexican friend uh, about uh, room for cooperation. How did the first Cold War start? Dov gave us a, uh, an excellent uh, high-Q version of the history. Um, basically, uh, Stalin and Churchill usually doesn't feature in Churchill's adulatory media, but Churchill basically conceded what is now Central and Eastern Europe to Stalin. Uh, that's how it happened. It was partly uh, then uh, brought to its uh, sharpest focus and edge through um, third world proxy wars, uh, military buildup, and of course things reaching the sharpest edge in a thermonuclear standoff. History never repeats itself, but as we all know, the residences are there. So when I look at China and the United States at present, um, there is a contest of ideology and about ideas. China represents an authoritarian capitalist system, and the United States, for all of its sins, uh, represents a liberal democratic capitalist system, and by and large, the collective West approximates that in one form or another. What is new, though, and this is the new resonance, is I see the manifestation of a new Cold War beginning to emerge, not through the classic military means, but in fact through the tools of the economy, which I referred to much earlier. And if I saw the earliest round and the exchange of it, it actually wasn't the beginning of the trade war. It was about a month before over ZTE or ZTE, the, American, uh, the Chinese firm, uh, which the Americans imposed, uh, well, comprehensive sanctions on. And Xi Jinping's response about the same time at the National Informationization Conference in, in China was, we Chinese can no longer rely upon the West to uh, have access to high technology, information, uh, artificial intelligence, the new information technology revolution. We will now produce all this uh, independently and autonomously by China itself. If you look at the language surrounding that and the American responses, these were the first exchanges in the new Cold War. The trade war is a further manifestation of it, and we're now seeing it on the investment front as well. Both end up being translated through into politics. This is what makes me anxious about where we now stand. Mm.
Okay, we have a lot of hands up. I know several here. I'm going to come to you, but it's two. It's it's it, one tends to go that way. I haven't had anything from this section yet. So, a gentleman right here who has his hand up um, first. I'm going to take quite a few questions just to bring the audience in. I know we won't be able to answer all of them, but. Um, Hello, my name is Aristide. I'm a Kevin scholar from Cameroon. Thank you all for your presentations. My question concerns transatlantic relations. These relations have been very bad recently, as we know. Um, the standoff between the EU, the UK on one hand, and the US has been really critical um, of recent. So if I raise issues like the Iranian nuclear deal or the Israel-Palestinian conflict, the US and the EU don't see things from the same perspective. So I'd like to know, is this just a one-in-a-moment issue which will go away once Trump leaves office and we have a new president? Or are relations between the EU and the US really facing a substantial shift? I appreciate if um, Dr. Dove can answer this question because... Mm. That's very know, helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Really important question. Uh, right here at the back. This gentleman here, and then I've got Don't two here. We've got, I'm going to take a series of comments and questions. Great. Hi. Yeah. Nicholas from the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. A uh, question for the panel and also for Dr. Vinja Muri as well. Um, there's been a lot of questions uh, framed around the theme of today, this year's uh, London conference and even this panel on geopolitical uh, competition. And, and building on the question earlier from uh, our, our fellow participant from Mexico, is that the accepted frame, that it is competition, that there's no mention of collaboration or cooperation? Uh, Singapore, uh, in the scheme of animals, uh, is, is certainly an ant definitely in relation to an elephant and even to a, to a very large cat. Uh, and at the same time, we are the chairman of ASEAN this year, the Association of Southeast Asian yeah. Nations. So <laughs> there is a lot of interest to see collaboration, cooperation, and certainly not geopolitical or even security uh, strategic competition. Uh, building on another event that just took place in Singapore, which was the uh, Trump Kim Summit, fairly historical, um, how does the panel then see uh, that particular development going? I, I, we hear all the criticisms of the lack of substance and the lack of any sort of practical movement, but is that a sign that we might be moving a bit away from competition to something a little bit more positive, uh, potentially? Thank you. I'll just mention here that uh, your question is, is echoed by somebody who's written in on Slido, is it? Uh, we are talking about geopolitical competition. What should be done to have an end in positive change and development rather than conflict? And also a question from the audience on um, posturing North America and posturing on the 48th parallel. So I think there are others who have similar concerns. Um, you had a question right here in the front, front row. Do you repeat the questions for me? Oh, that yeah. will come I'll back. try. You can hear the same sure. problem like I do. Okay. Uh, we won't get to all of them, but we'll try. Jelena Milic from Serbia. Sir, Montenegro has contributed uh, numerous rotations to ISAF mission uh, uh, in Afghanistan, for starters, and it has also something else to contribute to. It has a very good deep port bar in Mediterranean, and I think their NATO membership bid actually contributed to all of us from this part of the political spectrum to see how, how a ready current Kremlin administration is to impose all kinds of hybrid hostile operations short of legitimate uh, uh, full-scale uh, armed conflict. And to that end, to our Pakistani friend, I think it also has to do a lot with with a fraud, which part of the political spectrum or value spectrum you come when you assess Russian and Chinese influence uh, uh, throughout the world. It's not all about, you know, geography. Coming from Balkans, again, what I see is the Chinese and Russian influence come with strings attached which are anti-democratic, anti-liberal, anti-human rights, and I don't like it. Yes. I'm going to take a couple more, but just so that the panelists know, I'm going to have each of you just choose one question or one theme to respond to, so you can hold on to one. And in the coffee break, you'll have more opportunities to, to um, respond uh, as you will. So just back here. First gentleman, yes, exactly. Well, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Ran Zhongzhi. I'm from China Institute of International Studies. Congratulations for the panelists. I have a question to uh, Marilla Baker, uh, Madam. I'm very curious uh, your characterization that you just now mentioned China works like a cat, uh, Russia works like an elephant. But how would you characterize Germany 
Britain and the United States. Please, thank you. <laughs> uh, very, clearly a theme that's coming up, very important question. Um, right back here in the back, the gentleman in the middle of that section. Um, Tim Wilsey, uh, Chatham House Council. Can I ask Hina Rabani Khan? Um, I mean, you've, you've given a portrayal of a rather cozy relationship between Pakistan and China. But when your newspaper, Dawn, leaked the full strategic plan like for the China-Pakistan economic me? corridor, which had all sorts of neo-colonial like provisions I about provision of land, United jobs in Xinjiang, okay. all sorts of odd tax arrangements for Guada. Uh, can I comment on sort of it didn't seem quite as benign as you portrayed it? Mm -hmm. We're going to keep going. It's a bit risky strategy here, but just here in the back, the gentleman with his hand held high. Hi, uh, Nick Greenstock. Um, probably a question now uh, about. Can you say where, where sorry, you're? Sorry, Nick Greenstock from Gatehouse. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. Um, about the institutions and the institutional capacity at that global level to actually create the, the right sorts of fora for interaction, cooperation, and a move away from this slightly more sclerotic and competitive approach to international affairs. And then right up here in the front, the lady in red. Thank you. Kirsty Hughes, Scottish Central and European Relations. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel uh, their assessment of the European Union as a whole at the moment, not maybe as a cat or elephant or anything else, but simply whether it's influential um, and whether that influence you think has gone up or down in the last 10 years or so. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take a few more. We're only going to come back to the panelists one time, so be sure you know what you would like to say. Just over here in the front. Richard Bram, independent photographer, member of Chatham House. I was just in the Republic of Georgia, which rarely gets talked about. Um, and this is, again, goes back to the questions of Russian behavior, which come there certainly to what used to be called salami tactics, a tiny slice at a time. Uh, first it was Abkhazia, yeah. then they cross the border and occupy another section, and then the actual actions on the little micro borders within Georgia the soldiers just move forward, well, 100 yards today, 300 yards tomorrow, and suddenly this village is covered with Russian soldiers, whereas two weeks ago it wasn't, and the Georgians are going to start another war with Russia. So how does this play into things, especially in a country that when you go there, they have European Union flags everywhere. They want so much to be part yeah. of the European Union. Not yet, not yet. No, Sorry. I'm just... No, sorry, not yet. Uh, uh, the lady right here in the middle, right here in the middle. I'm sorry. All I did was say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Laura from Armenia, actually bordering Georgia. So I'm a Chivnik scholar here. Uh, we are talking about increased geopolitical competition. We talked about how to make it to end in like positive changes rather than in conflict. But I would, like to, uh, I would like to ask you to reflect upon the drivers, the main reasons of geopolitical competition in the 21st century. Because like previously, it was religion, it was land. What is it today? Is it economy? Is it the power? Is it military strength? What is driving geopolitical competition today? Thank you. Final question right here from the gentleman uh, on the other side. Four rows back, right there, yes, exactly. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm a evening scholar and <laughs> student at Imperial College London. I come from Afghanistan. Uh, I was surprised, uh, Ms. Hina Rabani Kar, she didn't mention about the regional issue of terrorism in that region, and I also come from that part of the world. Uh, and I think that is, that is the issue that is really geoparadizing all socioeconomic developments that could take place in that region in terms of trade, security, uh, and all other issues. Uh, she meant, mentioned about the refugees, about three million refugees that are still uh, in, in Pakistan, but uh, she, she didn't spoke about the, uh, the regional terrorism that is there, especially in Afghanistan going on. How, how does she see that evolving? And uh, it's, is it going to end anytime soon? Thank you. Okay, so we started about five minutes late, so we'll take another five minutes. So we have about one minute, no. maybe 90 seconds. Um, I, I'm afraid I do have to take one more question. This gentleman is desperate to ask. I, I, you get 
for the 35 seconds for your question, and then 90 seconds each, and we're going to finish um, right there. Yes, exactly. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Anthony Matons from Mozambique. I, I have a question. When the illiberal order goes to Iraq, Syria, Libya, it's fine, it's good. But when the illiberal order goes to Georgia, Ukraine, sorry, Ukraine, and other parts is bad. I would like to understand who's bad, who's good in that context. Thank you. Okay, I think we have, we have some great questions and no time to answer them, but there you go. Um, Marie, I'm gonna let you go first, if that's okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to pull back from uh, the animal question and uh, because I think I might get into trouble. So I will say China is moving like a ballet and um, Moscow uh, is moving like I would be wearing, uh, wearing very big boots and um, taking the, United, the role of the United States now, I'm not so sure whether I could say, well, at the moment, we can watch a clown in the circus or whether this is somebody with a serious plan or whether Kremlin did a very good investment because they have much more in their hand than we know. But if the United States do not play the role anymore to keep up international institutions on a certain level of truth. And I say certain level, because of course, the United Nations, the United States were not always true. I have been demonstrating against the Vietnam War. We all know it. But if we do not stick to the rules of the institutions, we are all going to get into trouble and Krem we are not in a Cold War at the moment because Kremlin's game is like the, the man from Georgia said, walking with slide by slide, using slide by slide and using our fear to answer firmly. The Georgian question in 2008 was negotiated between President Sarkozy and President Putin personally. Access for OCE, international red crush, nothing has happened. So this is what you cannot accept, because if you get into a, a way of behavior where rules are nothing anymore and trust is nothing anymore, then we are really back in Darwinist times, and this means the end of good living for all of us. So, you're next. <laughs> Lots of questions. I'm only allowed to give one answer, so get well. me afterwards. <laughs> um, briefly on Montenegro, I wasn't trying to minimize it. Like I said, we have allies for all kinds of reasons, so, and I can talk more about it afterwards. Uh, look, with, with regard to whether there's a Cold War with China, remember, we had virtually no investment in the Soviet Union. All you have to do, if any of you have visited Southeast China, Dongguan, Shenzhen, Shanghai, any of these places, you see lots of plants with American flags all over the place. We have heavy investments there. And the real issue is, can a trade, could Mr. Trump start a trade war? Yes. Can it last? I suspect not. We are too much into e each other's economies. Okay. That doesn't mean that worse things couldn't happen because Germany and Britain were each other's biggest trading partners before World War I. But the way it looks right now, it's going to be very difficult to sustain a trade war. And because of that, it seems to me that to talk about a Cold War with China is not really the right way to talk about it. I think it's an active competition in some cases, like the South China Sea, there may be confrontations, but it's not a Cold War in the sense that it was with the Soviet Union. Thank you. Hina. Yeah, okay. So, uh, first of all, specifically to, the, to my Afghan brother who asked the question, clearly 
since the topic wasn't about, I think terrorism has been a huge, huge, huge problem in the region. It has been holding the whole progress, regional connectivity and regional development back uh, in your country and mine. Uh, we have both been sufferers at the hands of terrorists, propagated and fueled by, you know, whoever we may want to point out, and depends on where we are as to who we want to point out. And I believe that if you are all able to work together, as we saw a brief interlude during Eid, it is possible to have peace in your country also. We all need to come together and work towards it, and I, frankly speaking, think it is quite very possible. I, and a question uh, over there about uh, how Chinese influence in Pakistan doesn't seem to be as benign. When you have a $60 investment coming in, clearly there is going to be areas which are uh, where people are going to perhaps lose jobs, others are going to get jobs, etc. But the broad, we are talking about broader trends. I think if you were to ask, take me to, ask me to take a judgment call on the broader trend, then perhaps I would say as much as 80 to 90 percent, and that's huge, of people in Pakistan entirely believe uh, in the type of, you know, their view of China is very, very similar to what I said. And what you uh, said, uh, depending on which political spectrum, which end of the political spectrum you're coming from, it's absolutely correct. And it's also absolutely correct that it depends on where, what your geographical location is. Because whichever political spectrum end you come from where I'm sitting, uh, my views will remain the same. Because there is no political influence, there's no influence on democracy, etc., by these countries, on countries like mine. So it is still, I would like to argue, geography, which has a huge role to play as to which country tries to be what to which uh, area or region. And Kevin, final comments from you, and if you can bring us to a close and, and send oh, us off to our coffee break, that would be terrific. I stand between you and coffee, and hopefully some cake as well. The um, <laughs> Chatham House budget extended that, Robin? <laughs> cake. Bickies, that's great. The, um, well, cats, uh, elephants, I'm just your average Australian kangaroo. And uh, <laughs> the only thing kangaroos know how to do is jump, okay? And uh, they jump quite elegantly, so I'm going to jump across two questions which have, uh, uh, which have been put this morning. Um, one was about uh, what actually is driving the subject we have before us, which is geopolitical competition. And the other is, going back again to Mexico, uh, and others, which is, is there any cooperative mechanism at present, institutionally or otherwise, which pulls us away from that brink? So on the drivers, I'm, my melancholy duty is to report that uh, deep strategic realism, for people who study international relations theory, is alive and well in the world today. They, they read it and imbibe it in Beijing, they read it and imbibe it in Moscow, they read and imbibe it in Washington, and and many other capitals, most other capitals in the world, driven by geography. The classic security dilemma. Who do I trust? What do I do to defend myself? Once I defend myself, the people next door to me or in my region, then they believe that's not defensive but offensive, and so is the sorry tale of history. Mm. What is sobering is that we in the world have just been through several decades of unprecedented globalization. Um, for the reasons and the manifestations which I've just spoken about in Southeast China, you've got a bunch of American firms. Yet, up until now, the forces of globalization at work through technology, through commerce, through industry, through trade, through investment and people-to-people -people movements uh, have not been able to extinguish the flames of classic strategic realism. And the further compounding factor is that our global institutions, which we've grown since 1944-45, are basically all dying the death of a thousand cuts. UN, it's there, but the Security Council is basically frozen on the big stuff. Uh, and so it goes through the rest of the institutions. So what do we do in terms of the Mexican question? by our young friend from, from the Chevening Scholar before. Uh, and Mexico is relevant to the answer to this. Because when I look around the global institutional um, uh, carnage uh, in the world today, we have these shells of institutions not doing much, except having meetings. Um, and so, and the one in Geneva will be having less from now on, that's the uh, Human Rights Commission. And so there's one institution which we actually created out of the global financial crisis, which is the G20. Now, it's basically to date not fully exercised its mandate. But because you've got a whole bunch of states, 20 of them, uh, which represent the largest economies in the world, but each interestingly spread across the large continents of the world. You've got three Latin Americans, you've got half a dozen um, from Asia, you've got uh, others from Europe, you've got uh, others from Africa and the Middle East. 
Frankly, given the crisis of the order, it is the only mechanism which brings together the decision makers from the 20 most powerful countries in the world around a table with an agenda now, which is not just financial, which is broadly economic, and now there are foreign ministers meetings as well. The virtue of that is that you can have a coalition of the policy willing, led by Mexico, led by Canada, led by uh, countries like uh, Indonesia, by South Korea, by Japan, uh, the Europeans, the French, the Germans, the British, even us. We'll bring the beer, Australians. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, that is the institutional machinery which could uh, act as the, um, the emergency ward uh, for the current fracturing of the global rules space system. Very good. Thank you for bringing us to really what the, was yeah, at the heart you. of the panel, which was responses and to responding to a number of the questions about where is the prospect and the hope. And we'll come back to the gentleman from Singapore. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our panelists for a really tremendous set of comments.